Okay, let's get started. How many people still cannot install or run um, the Apache Tori kernel on their machine? I was gonna say, with no one showing their hands, I will say, does that mean everyone's got it running? Um, what's that? As long as you have it running, that's, um, you know, part of what we're experiencing is one of the hardest problems in computer science, right? And this problem is going to plague you for the rest of your life, right? How do we get software so that it can be easily installed on multiple machines and run? Right, um, and actually, Microsoft spent billions of dollars trying to solve this problem, and it took them over a decade to sort of get it work sort of well. Um, and now, Docker is another attempt to solve this problem, right? And that is. Um, when the problem is you have multiple machines, and even if your best effort, those machines will have slightly different environments somehow, right? Because if you're on the Windows, there's a DAL that's missing or not there, or the wrong version. If you're on Unix, there's a version of Unix, and people install this and they don't install that. And then there's all the dependencies, right? And you use, I want to install A, but A requires B, C, and D. But B requires E, F, and G, and G requires, and so you, you trace these dependencies back. Um, and there are times when it's just very hard to get all the dependencies that you need, right? Um, if you've done any system end work, you know this is a nightmare. Um, and so what Docker is, is it's like a virtual machine. Right, but it's not a virtual machine because all we're trying to do is set up your machine so it can run a particular piece of software. You don't need a full blown operating system to do that, right? Um, so yeah, at one point people were pushing, oh, let's just install a virtual machine for this environment. Uh, Docker's attempt to be slightly thinner, so they call, it's what they call a container, right? And so the idea is, oh, we'll, Docker will write an application which runs on Windows and Mac OS and Linux, and this can provide all the stuff you need to interact with the operating system, and then you produce an image which, which contains the software you want to run, right? And then what happens is, oh, someone will create an image for your development team, right? And then, you say, here's, if you want, you're working on project X, here's the image you start with. It has all the stuff you need, right? So you don't have this programmer saying, but I can't, I can't run this because this, I don't know why, right? Um, and then you have the problem of once, you know, once you have the application, you want to run it on a server, how do you make sure that the server is configured so it runs on the machine? So again, the Docker is a solution to attempt that because now you've got this image and you write, everyone uses the same image on Docker and, and then finally, when you deploy it, you then deploy the Docker image that you, you make run. So you don't have to make various, um, you know, some IT guy doesn't have to beat the head against the wall to figure out why the software runs on developed machines, but on this one case, it doesn't work on the server machine, right? <clears throat> so, and again, for the people on Windows, right? Since it's a, it requires this hyper, hyper, hyper V, um, because this, and it, that doesn't work on Windows Home. Um, So you, it becomes a problem, right? Now some people, some 
some people are done with assignment and some people are almost done with assignments and some people haven't even started, right? Um, because of the problem, so I've extended the deadline until next Wednesday. Um, but it doesn't give you, I mean, if you haven't started yet, it doesn't give you much time. We need to get this problem solved, right? Um, and yes, it's painful to upgrade your OS in the middle of the semester. I, I tend to avoid that if at all possible because there's always problems and, um, but at least you're not updating a brand new operating system, you're updating an operating system you got from a slightly crippled version to a slightly less crippled version. Um, so presumably there should be fewer problems in doing that than going from Windows 10 to Windows 11, right? That, who knows what that would happen. Um, So, I, so for those of you who still haven't gotten things working right, um, on the course website, um, I do have, you know, a, a link to Docker, which brings you the Docker website, which allows you to download the Docker application. Um, and once you get that installed and running, then you need um, the image that is pre-configured to run Spark and Jupyter Notebook with Apache Tori plugin, right? And it, all three of those things are configured in that image. So you, if you once you have Docker, you can then just use Docker to deal with it, right? And when you go to this link, right, it it you. It tells you how to right download Docker, and the command is Docker, so it assumes that Docker is on your machine and you can run it, and it's in your path, right? They don't tell you to make sure it's on your path, but I mean, it, when you, that's a command, and you type in, you go to the terminal and you type Docker. It doesn't say what Docker. Uh, you know what the problem is. Um, and then when you, oops, you know, scroll down, it tells you what it gives you. Um, and then it gives you this command of, you know, you have to start Docker up and then you can execute the command. And when you do that, let's see. Don't, um, when I run this command, right, you get a bunch of output, and the last line it says, you know, to log in, here is the URL to use because Jupyter Notebooks are web-based, right? Um, and then there's a URL, and then there's a token because to authenticate you, and enough, um, See if I can do this and copy it. And then and when I type in it, I get to go to a working notebook. And then on new, I can say, well, I want, it gives me various options. I can just do regular Python or R but we're interested in the first, right? And now I have a Jupyter Notebook that's running Spark, and I can start doing Spark things. Spark context dot version, and then I can run. Right, we get the output. So far, so good. Now, um, there is one thing you have to be aware of. Come on, where am I? Okay, we come back here. 
Um, yeah. Um, I need to point out the command you run, right? To run the Jupyter Docker. Docker. There is this one little thing, dash dash rm. What do you think that does? And normal rm does what? It deletes things. Um, so what this is doing is saying, when I'm done with this image, don't save it. Oh, and what does that do? Oh, so you go in, you create your notebook, you do a bunch of work, and you use, you know, you're doing save, 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 and then when you're done, you exit the, you go back to your terminal and say quit, right? And then the next day you come back and you start up Docker again, and where's your work? Oops, right? Um, it's not there because it says RM, right? Um, now, there's a good reason for that, in the sense that that means that every time you start up, you're gonna start up with a known working configuration, right? Um, so if you really screw something up, you just quit and go back and it's still gonna run, because you're just starting from scratch again. But, so if you're using this system, what you want to do is when you're done, there is a download as, right? And you want to download as a notebook, right? And then when you, um, Next time you go back to start up again, there's going to be a upload button and then you go and select your notebook and then upload it again, right? And then continue on from where you were, right? So far so good? Any questions, problems, issues? Presum I presume it saves it, but I haven't tried it. And you know, Docker is something that graduate students in computer science should have some experience with. There are competing systems, right? Google has their own, and I forget, what's that? And there's one on Linux, but, and there's Kerberos, not it's K something, not Kerberos, a different system, I mean. But there's a number of different type of these container-like things, um, so it's becoming more popular or more common for people to use use them. Okay. Um, now I have a question for you. Um, in the assignment, I ask you to compute a window, right? Compute the average over a window. What's the window? Yeah, well, so a sliding window, right? So we have some sort of data set with some sort of, um, let me, the way I like to think about it is, 
you know, we have some sort of data. Um, the most obvious way to motivate it is like stock, stock, right? Like with the average of stock, but stocks are, they never stop trading them, right? And the, the stocks now are traded 24 hours a day around the globe. And so there's no starting point and ending point when we say, give me the average day because they never stop. And since it's, they're traded around the globe, you can't say, well, we just worry about New York time because, you know, but if you're in India, right, it's a different time zone. And so you pick some sort of, you know, segment of that time and then compute the average of that. So it's a window into the inv into that particular, right, set of data. And then, of course, since it's a window, we can then move it and compute it again and again and again. And this is something um, that's a very common operation once you have this type of data. And we'll see more of it when we talk about streaming, where I mean, there's, there's, you just have a stream of data continually is coming into you, right? Um, stock market's one. You can talk about you know, Amazon trying to figure out, um, analyze what's going on, right? But then, I mean, it's 24 hours a day with millions of transactions every hour, probably every minute, right? And so there's no starting point, there's no stopping point. And it, okay, any, any questions? Any? Any questions about the assignment? So, about the assignment, uh, and just the, are we supposed to make a sort of context problem and stop it? So, the question is should we make one spark context for each problem um, or do it once, right? Um, you know, notebooks, you only have to do it once. Also, um, if you're using the Apache Tori, you don't have to create one because it already exists. So I've had problems with saying, oh, you can't have multiple contacts. Like, you talk about because there's already one, they, they create one for you. So like, like I, sh I mean, if they go back, um, Um, you know, there's my notebook, right? And I didn't do anything. I just said spark context. I didn't. I didn't create it. I mean, it was already existed for me. No imp. I mean, nothing, right? It's just spark sc dot something. It works. Now, they don't create Spark for you, right? If I just say Spark, try and run it, it should tell me, oh, there is a Spark session. I didn't really, right? So there's even, a Spark session. What's that? What is? Yeah. And what you don't see is since I'm using Docker here, I didn't have to install Spark either, right? Because, because Spark was installed in the image. Any other questions about the assignment? No, so either everyone is so far along, they've got it under control, or they're so far behind, they're 
have no idea what question to ask. And they're hoping for some miracle this weekend, right? What's that? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes, we all have times when we are hoping that there will be a, a miracle over the weekend, right? And, right. People don't have questions, then let's. So I forget where we left off last time. Um, we were talking about, we did talk about um, RDDs, right, and various transformations, action we can perform. And we're then looking at some of the actions and transformations on, right, um, data frames. And we saw this little language start embedding in strings and, you know, remind you, okay, um, what types of functions you can call in there, you'll find listed um, primarily in uh, this functions class, All right? And there's quite a few of them and you have to look them up. Um, and that's part of the assignment, right? Is being able to find what methods you have. Um, I'll thank you. You'll find that once you actually do finish the assignment, um, there's not that much code you write, but it's it's getting everything working and then installed, um, and then figuring out which method to use to do what. So some other things we can do is we can add columns to data frames. Um, so here with column, and that's then what we do is there's a title for the column, and then what on the column, and here it's showing you lit for literal, so it's great column all ones. Um, here I'm creating a new column with random numbers, right? Like, you know, putting a, a function here which generates various types of information. And this is sort of deceptive in the sense of it looks like, oh, I'm adding to an existing data frame, but data frames are immutable. You can't change them. So what's happening is you're returning a new data frame, and then I'm saying call and show on it, then I'm throwing the data frame away which is probably not what you want to do in real life. Um, you know, and then we can, you know, add columns to a new data frame and use expression to compute some values. So here, you know, just what, you know, when two columns are equal, um, You know, I can rename um, columns. So again, most of this should seem fairly familiar to people who know SQL, right? It's like same type of operations, syntax is a little different. Um, there are a number of functions we can call to manipulate dates and timestamps. You know, so here I'm reading in, you know, timestamps and I can compute them, you know, you know, take a timestamp and convert it to a date. I can also convert it to a time. Um, and then we can start doing various things where I can, 
you know, get dates and hours and months, and I can then, right? And getting the month column, you know, you, you get the month with a standard um, SQL-like um, date formats and strings, right? Where 1M gives you, a, I think, one the, the first three letters of the month, and if you have three or more, you get the full name. Questions? And here's an example where, you know, I, I start with a data frame and then I, you know, add a column and another column and add a column to that and another column to that and create, you know. But again, what's happening, right, just keep in mind that these, all these data frames are evaluated lazily. And then when you want the actual value, right, Spark has this plan, right? And that plan optimizes it so we're not, we don't make multiple passes. We don't make a pass to create one column, and, right? We, we basically do it all in one pass. It's highly optimized. And we look at the plan, it just says, well, I'm gonna have this column, that column, that column, period, right? It doesn't say do this. And then when you're done with that, do this. It's no, we're going to make one pass through that initial data frame, and we're going to end up making all the columns at the same time. All right? So we don't have to worry about, oh, I'm going to try and create a crazy loop and do a bunch of stuff in the loop to make you know, more optimized. We can do it like this and say, well, do this and then this and this and this and this, and then Spark will take care of optimizing it for us. And we can, you know, drop columns and make it it's just SQL, right? So if we do it all the time in SQL, um, we can select um, various rows and we can either use filter or where. Um, either one works and the filter comes from the functional world and where comes from the SQL side, right? Do the same thing, same arguments. Um, Right, and again, we could do this funny, crazy thing, which I really, um, you know, the first one makes more sense to me where I take a column and then I can do operations on it. I can also start embedding in a string and then it's interpreted for us. Um, And again, I can then chain them, you know, to. But when I chain them like this, they're and together, right? I do the first one and then the next one has to be true, right? So I'm done. Both those conditions are true. Um, And so here what I'm doing is, well, I, I create a column where, right, our origin, destination, country name are the same. And then um, I select the row where that column is true. And since the data only contains flights to or from the United States, there's only one row. And then we find out that, yeah, we get 370. Like I said, when we do multiple where's, right, or filters, it's an and condition, this condition and that condition. This example also shows that, you know, we can create variables which contain those conditions, right, and then put those variables in the where. We don't have to do all the work inside the where, which is sort of nice. Um, because that allows us to break that line up a bit, and we might want to reuse some of those things other places, so we don't have to repeat our code.
But of course, there are times when you want an or, right? So um, there's an or, right? We can have an or statement where I want, you know, frequent flights or things that um, end in the United States, right? And so we get, you know, things which are, are just end up in the United States, but they're not have a hundred, or I get one that doesn't end in the United States, but is has a large number of flights. And of course, if you've got ors, then we need, you know, not, and again, we can either use exclamation point as pretty common or not, I mean, not itself, right? And so here's an example of using not, an example of using, you know, the exclamation point for not. Um, distinct, I mean, this is exactly what you think it does, right? Um, so I'm selecting, right, the column, origin, and then I just want all come which are distinct, um, and then I sort them, and I take the top ten. On this slide, notice that the periods are at the end. The reason is, if I put the periods at the end and run that in the notebook, it will do it, right? But if we have the periods here and not there, you know, it'll complain because of the yeah, rent. I mean. It's the end of sentence, so there should be another, you know, what's this thing at doing, right? It confuses the compiler. And then, of course, or we can write a single line, right? But the problem is it gets, it gets hard to read, right? Um, Two, okay, three gets, you know, painful, four gets through a long line, and it starts wrapping around. Um, this, this is much easier to read, right? It's, I do this, this, and this, and this, I'm done, right? Um, although I should have, the indentation is not correct because the take is on the whole thing, so this should have been indented more. Um, And then of course we can, you know, or by it's like it's like an S, it's like an SQL class, right? I mean we're just we're just doing all the standard SQL things. Um, That doesn't work, no. Now, one reference I said said that should work, right? And I tried, and it's like, no. Um, but you know, this will work, right? Um, So I did order by expression, I want an ascending right, and then I do this, and then I want an order by count descending. It's like, huh? I mean, wait a minute, I mean, I, I'm getting the same result. Not sure why, um, but I got the same result. There's a lot more of you than me, so perhaps one of you can figure out what's going on. But and then we can, when we make a request, we can say, just give me, you know, the first n values, right? And that's and that's common. You're dealing with a huge data set. Um, you know, maybe most information, I mean, 
get millions of rows and you, know, you sort them and then the last 10,000 rows or so have so few numbers of them you don't care because it, and so we just you know just give me the top top number and we have these various um, operations right take and collect take gives me n number of columns and returns them the rows and collect returns everything right And we can add more rows to existing columns. So you might, there are times when you may want to have two data frames and combine them together. And then we can do that. So what I'm doing here is, um, well, the first thing I do is I get the schema for the data frame I want to start because when I combine two data frames, the schema has to be the same, right? Otherwise, I mean, how's it going to work, right? Because you you can combine them, and each column has a name and a type. And if they have different columns or names, I mean, how are you going to combine? Um, so I, I create my schema. Um, I create a couple rows, and then I have to take the, that row and paralyze it into a RDD. And then from that RDD, I can then um, create a Data frame. How to create a data frame from an RDD? Well, I need the RDD and I need the schema, right? And once I got the schema and RDD, then we can then create the data frame and then the union. Right. So we can. I can. I can union tables to, you know, and there was the output, and you know, look at the very end, you get the um, new row added. You know, we, you know, they built in taking random samples. Um, there's a sample method, right, on a data frame. And the first argument is, do you want replacement or not? Um, second argument is, how much of the sample do you want? How, how big do you want the sample to be? What fraction of the total data set? Right? And then, the third argument is optional. Well, you know, what seed do you want to use the random number generator that they're going to use to, right, do the selection? Now, something we need to know right now, but we can also do what they call random splits. Um, this is common when you're doing training. You tra you're going to train an algorithm. So you have a neural network, you want to train it. So you have this big data set. You want to take one chunk and use it to train it. And then you want to take the rest of it and use it to actually validate that it, to, it's recognizing what it's supposed to, right? And you don't, you don't want things to appear in both places because that, that's cheating because using the data you train to see what works right is like, well, of course it works on the data you train because that's what you trained it on, right? The issue is when you train it, we'll work on other data. Um, and so a split will split into two distinct sets and you can tell it how big do you each piece, right? Um, you know, here example of doing a random split and you, it, it breaks into two pieces. Um, and it normalizes the percent so if you have it less than one or greater than one, and just normalize it to, so that it will divide everything into, um, you know, if you wanted two, two spots each, 90%, well, you can't do that, so it's gonna, it's gonna shrink them down to normalize it to one. And that's what I show here, if I, you know, 
the sum of the two splits is not going to be one, so I'll just start fine. I'll just normalize it and use that those values. Something slightly more interesting. Um, there's a bunch of built-in functions we can use in this crazy language, um, but we can add our own function. In the SQL world, we can create, well, it's harder to create functions we can use in SQL because the SQL language doesn't support it, but we can have you know, embedded um, functions on the database. And so here, um, I define a function called add, right? But I can't use it directly. Why? Because the problem is when I use it, I'm going to pass in a column thing, right? And it doesn't, you write it not to accept a column, you write it to accept a value that's going to be in a single row in that column. And then you use some spark magic to, you know, you use a defined function. You pass in your function, and you tell it what input it's going to accept, what's going to return, and it returns a, another function with basically a wrapper around that one, which will work inside this crazy little language, right? So this is, um, you know, one feature we don't get, have really in SQL, but it, it's a powerful feature because now we can, we can actually write functions to transform our data, do things with it, um, not be restricted to just what they give us, right? Questions? Um, what happens when there's a type mismatch? So here's my add function. And I say, I want to call it on a column which has strings. What do I get? We don't get a runtime exception, right? That's, it's difficult to deal with runtime exceptions when you're doing a cluster, right? Because the work is done on remote machines. And then what? what your program is supposed to do, right? And so what happens here is, it's like, you said it's gonna be a, a long and it's a string, I have no idea what to do, so it just returns no. And so you have to be aware of that, and basically, when we're doing processing in Spark, as we'll see later, we want to be able to then filter up with null deal with null values. And I've, I've read that people say that 90% of data science is just cleaning your data sets so you can actually run code on them. Um, we can actually change how many partitions we're using on a, a data frame or data set or RD, RDR. And we can also, we can increase the number and decrease the number. Um, so the repartition method, um, and when we call repartition, it causes what we call a shuffle. Uh, and that is data gets shuffled around between the machines. Coalesce doesn't it, it just combines them. Um, here's an example, I started with an RDD, it had one partition, 
Um, You know, the lines got intermixed. It should be the other way around. I create a, I take my data frame, right? And I send it to part four, and then I ask the number of partitions, I get four. And then when I actually write out the data, um, I get, um, you know, actually for each partition, I'm gonna get a file, right? And one reason you may want partition, if you're going to do a lot of queries on a particular column, um, then you might want to consider repartitioning on that column. Why? Because it's going to then reshuffle the data so that the data which is, have the same values on that column are going to be in the same machine, right? And so then your queries on that column are going to be more efficient. But if you only do one query, it's not going to be worth the shuffle because shuffles are very slow. But if you do multiple queries on that data set on the same column, you may want to repartition based upon that particular um, column. No, 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 no. When, when I do a re repartition, um, it's, if I just say repartition, it's going to repartition using the same number of partitions that already exist. When I give it a number, it's going to use that many partitions, right? Yes, yeah, so the data will be on different machines. Now, if I I set my process up to use five machines and I asked it to repartition to use 10 partitions, it will do that. But that means then that some machines, probably all of them have more than one partition, right? So when we then ask to do work, right, those two, no, those machines are gonna have to do, do extra work, right? So I tried it on my laptop and it doesn't have seven cores. And I tried seven and it, it did it, it did all the operations and wrote it out. I got seven files. Um, so some cores were processing more than one partition. I don't know how they allocate the partitions. I presume they try and balance it out. Uh, one more topic before we get to something interesting. Um, we've got functions which aggregate data. We're going to summarize, group by. Um, the various functions of aggregation. Um, most of these have obvious meanings. Um, some example where you know on the data set, you know, give me the mean of that column, give me the max, give me a standard deviation. Um, right. Um, there's a different, there's a standard deviation sample and standard deviation population. Um, if you're not a statistician, you're probably like, uh, what, how can there be two different types of standard deviations? Um, it turns out that when you, when you take a, a sample of the population and compute the, compute the standard deviation, there's a, there's a bias in that calculation. And so there's a correction called the Bessel correction that you use. Try and compensate for that, um, and so the standard deviation sample is a slightly different calculation than if you do it for the population. 
And the difference is when you calculate standard deviation, you do this calculation divide by n, right? Um, so the population, you divide by the population size. The Bessel correction for the sample is divided by n minus 1. Um, You know, we can count things. So here, counting columns which are distinct. Um, you know, looking for two columns, both of them have to be you know distinct, so we get pairs. Um, we want all three to be distinct. Um, right, so we start to doing various counting things. Count distinct is a single function, right? And it counts how many of these columns I give are distinct, right? And I give two columns, then they, right, really not pairs, not the pairs to be distinct. And then there is group by, again, if you know SQL, right, there's a similar operation in SQL. Um, all right, didn't I have orders? Oh, well, um, I thought I had embedded the, the, the file I'm reading. Um, yeah, so here's the entire file, right? I got Customers A, B, A, B, and they, you know, some maybe sort of orders, right? How much each order was, and they're different orders. A has three, B has two, and C has three, right? Um, now I want to ask the question: Well, how much total has A ordered? How much total has B ordered, right? Um, And so I can now start doing, okay, I'm going to group by um, customer, and I want to compute the sum and the mean and the count. Well, what that group by does, I get the result not of the entire table, but I do these calculations per customer. So customer A had a total of, right, nine, about nine things. The average was three. The total number of orders was three, right? B, the total was 48. So I'm actually, the sum and the mean and the count are being done per value in that um, customer column. Questions? Again, it's all pretty similar to SQL, right? I mean, there's So let's do something slightly more interesting. Um, I want to look at word count, and then I want to look at Hadoop for a little bit. Um, so this word count problem is basically the whole, the whole world of Hadoop. Um, every book you'll read on Hadoop will start with a word count program. Every tutorial you'll read will start with a word count problem, right? It is the basic thing you do. Now, all the examples you'll see, the standard problem is I've got a file with a bunch of text, right? And I want to, we want to count how many times each word 
occurs in that text. Now, when you're reading the, the spark in a dupe literature, people, they really don't care what a word is, right? They're just showing you how to, what approach to take. There are people who do care, right? There are people who do this analysis and take it very seriously, and they've written libraries to take a word and take a text and tell you when, what a word is, right? Because there's all these crazy things in English. There's, there's hyphenations and there's abbreviations and there's prefixes and suffixes. And so it's, it becomes very complicated. We're not going to worry about that, right? So the standard thing people do to show you how to deal with this problem is to just break words up by spaces, right? But that is very simplistic. Um, so let's look at how we do this sequentially, right? I want to count how many how many words, how many, how many times each word occurs in this text. Oh, so what would you do? One approach would be I break it into words, right? And then I'm going to scan from left to right. And then I'm going to create a, a map, right? And each word becomes a key in the map. And every, the first time I come across a word, I'm going to put it in the, in the map or dictionary with one. And the second time I find it in there, I'm going to increment that value by one, right? And so I create a map. And I do A. And then next word is cat. And so my map now contains two keys. I come across A again, so I increment the value, right? And then I do bat, and then I can do cat again, right? Um, there's A, and now I get to do cat again, and finally I get to do hat, right? Basically, it's a problem we could give one of seven students, say, just go count these words, right? The problem is this algorithm is inherently sequential, right? Now, we, what we could do is we could break up that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm giving a small file that's an example, but just assume the file is 100 megabytes of text, right? We could break that file into various pieces and send those pieces off the machine, and each machine could then, you know, go through it, but we're, we're assuming that there's some global map here, right? And so if we did it on each machine, we'd get all these maps and we'd somehow combine all the maps, right? And that doesn't work very well. So how do we do this in Hadoop or Spark? Well, the first thing we're gonna do is we, you know, again, we're going to use a distributed file system. So when we put this file on the file system, it's broken into partitions for us or blocks, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to, on each machine, we're going to break that into different words. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take those words and Map them into tuples. Not not a map, but tuples. The first value is a word, and the second element of the tuple is the number of times it occurred. And so at this point, it's all going to be one, right? And now what we're going to do with each machine, we're going to start reducing them by, right, combining letters which are similar. So here on the first machine, I get two, and the other one, there's no repeats, so I, right? But now I need to combine them all together, right? And how do we do this? Well, now we get, with the, again, the shuffle, right? We need to send tuples that are the same word to the same machine. Right, so I did this on um, with three partitions, and so what happened is the A got sent to the middle, the middle machine, right, and then we can combine it. Cat stayed in the first machine, hat stayed in the last machine, and bat went from the second machine to third machine. 
right? So what's happening is, right, Spark or Hadoop is going to say, okay, I need to take all these tuples and send the tuples of the same letter to the same machine. But when we look at the example, we say, well, it's sort of inefficient to send A, why don't we keep it where it is, right? But we're talking about a system we probably have millions of tuples scattered across multiple machines. And so Spark is going to make, or Hoop is going to make some some quick estimate of where things should go and send it there, right? Is it clear what they're doing? Right. Now, if you think of in sequential terms, this is not very efficient, right? I mean, why do we create a tuple for each one then we need to combine them all together? Why not just go through a list of one at a time and just do it in the map? But the problem is we're we're doing this on multiple machines. Right. And so then what happens is right going from the first step to second step, that's a split, right? And then we use map, right, to map each letter to a tuple. And then we use reduce by key, right, to carry out the final step. But the reduce by key is done in two phases. The first phase is we do the reduce on each machine. And then we, we finish it up by Shuffling all the data so that all the tuples that start with A are on the same machine, all the tuples start with B are on the same machine, etc. Right? And so this is this built in shuffle. So when you do reduce by key, the shuffle happens automatically. Right? When we do a reduce, right, the shuffle happens automatically if need be. Questions? Yeah, the question is how to determine which tuple goes where, right? Um, you have to keep in mind what the situation is. Situation is going to be, you know, I have a hundred, I've got a text file with a hundred mega, hundred megabytes of text, right? So there's tens of thousands of these tuples, hundreds of, I mean, who knows how many. Hundred thousand tuples, right? Um, we we don't want to take time to figure out, oh, count how many of each tuple exists on each machine, and figure out what the optimal situation is. It take too long, right? So basically, Spark is going to make a quick judgment on who goes where, and the goal is to try and balance things out, right? Because we may do more operations on these things, on these tuples later on. And so we don't want a bunch of them in one machine and the other machine's empty. But again, that's hard to do because you have to know how many of each type. So we're gonna do a sample, right? We'll just do a quick sample, figure out how many how many of each type there is, and then based on that we're just going to do it, right? There, yeah, it does a it does a quick sampling and then figure out what to do and then it's and it it's not something that when we do we do this by it's in our in our control to do. Um, the reduced by key no not reduce not reduced by key no. If need be, we can repartition again later, but that, that again is expensive operation. So the question is, what happens in the, in the middle of operation, one machine crashes, right? What happens? Um, 
Well, it's called an RDD, right? Um, and the R stands resilient. So how is it resilient? Um, they do a number of different things to make sure it's resilient. Typically, um, when I've got N machine, they got this 100 megabyte or 10 terabyte or whatever it is file. It breaks it into pieces, right? And then you're going to send a piece to each, each machine. Well, the first thing you could do is you, you could, it's going to send each piece to more than one machine as a backup, right? So if the machine that has piece A crashes, there's going to be another machine that has piece A, piece A that can take over for, for that machine. Right. The second thing is, if we've got a data frame, right? The data frame has a plan, right? And that plan contains all the operations we need to do to do the computation, right? And that data frame is going to go on each machine. And so the machine that got the backup version of part A also has a data frame and knows how to recompute all the operations on it. Right, and then there's a master that's controlling everything and, and is continually doing a heartbeat, right? Every second, I guess every second default, it checks to see whether all the machines are still doing something. And if it doesn't get a response, and I forget the exact time, but at some point it says, I'm not getting any response to the machine, so I'm going to assume it's dead and I'm going to ignore it from now on and I'm going to, you know, tell other machine take over for that machine. The question is, where the master crashes, what happens? Um, I know the answer for Hadoop. Um, in Hadoop, what you do is there's a master and a shadow master, different machines, right? I mean, literally, and so then if the master goes down, you've got a shadow master that's okay, it's continually pinging the, the the real master. It went away, so it now then, so okay, that guy's done. I'm now the real master, and I'm going to take over, and I'm going to assign another machine to be a shadow master, right? Oh, the question is, when we do a shuffle, is the data going to the master then? No, I think it's going, I mean, directly to the... The master is probably involved in saying, okay, go your shuffle and, yeah. So the question is, does the master get all the data? At this point, we've only done transformations, right? The master doesn't get any data until we actually do an action. And actually, none of this happens until we do an action, right? And if we look at, you know, here is a Scala program which does this, right? I have a tech, you know, file called text file. Um, I then, I do a flat map on it. Um, to split it into lines, and then I do my map and I'm reduce, right? And until I call save as text file, nothing's happened, right? Well, what's happened is it's it's created, you know, it'll create this plan, etc. But until I do this, it doesn't even read the file, and then it all happens. So until the master says, you know, give me some information, none of it happens. And in this case, right, save as text file, it doesn't return any data to the to the master, it just says do it. And then well it does, but because all the all, all the files get sent to the master and saved on the master machines, so you can actually read them without having to go and you know, log on to your hundred Machine individually and grab the file off. But.
Um, the question is, what happens to all the data um, in the Spark world until you quit, when you run in a cluster, until you actually exit Spark, um, the data is still on the, on the cluster machines. I believe that when you um, exit um, Spark, they, they don't erase the files, right? You never really erase files, um, but you're gonna lose reference to them. And that, that space should be available for use elsewhere. The Java file to do this in Java is a little, little, um, little longer, and I didn't change the file, you know, file names, but you know, we have to use Java pair RDDs, and we have to give it a tad, you know, the first is the strings, and then it's going to have strings and count, right? Um, and so it's a little bit different, it's a little bit more work. Any questions? And then one last thing, why flat map was it due? Well, um, if my text file looks like this, when I read it in, um, I get a line, I get a row in my RDD or data frame per line. And so when I do a split on it, I get each row now has a collection of things. And so if I now do a map, when I do a map, I get, right, I get two rows where each row has a collection of things. So I do a split that basically um, flattens it out when we do a, a, a flat map. Instead of getting a collection of collections, I get one collection of all the individual elements. And so using a flat map is pretty common. So we'll end here. Um, next time we'll start looking at how we would do this in Hadoop and some of the, some of the issues around Hadoop so you have at least seen it. And so you'll know why I started with Spark rather than Hadoop.